1936 also marked the beginning of the war in Spain, the civil war in Spain, and the defense of democracy against fascism. This was the international face of the workers' struggle, said the Communist Party. And workers in Canada had to rise to the occasion, sending money and volunteers from their own class to defend democracy and the Republican government against Franco and Mussolini. Workers signed up for the Mackenzie Papineau Battalion in Canada by the hundreds. Many died in Spain and others during the World War that followed. The Canadian campaign for democracy in Spain had a profound impact on the left and progressive workers in Canada and their understanding of international working class solidarity and fascism. The fight to build strong unions and a labor movement that was independent, meaning class-based, sovereign, that is, based in Canada and led by Canadians, and united, that is, politically, on policies and objective, and organizationally with respect to independent labor political action. Uh, so this went hand in hand with the struggle to build a workers' political party, the Communist Party, whose goal was working class political power in a worker state. In the eyes of the employers and the Tory government of R.B. Bennett in 1930, <laughs> this was sedition. A year later, the Communist Party was declared illegal, its leaders imprisoned, and an assassination attempt made on the life of party leader Tib Buck while he was in jail in Kingston by Kingston jail guards. After a mass campaign to free them, led by the Canadian Labour Defence League, the eight were freed, and Tim Buck returned to Toronto to address an overflow, an overflow crowd of 17,000 at Maple Leaf Gardens in Toronto, uh, with another 8,000 outside. And there are photos of it, it's just amazing. It was December 1934. The momentum behind the Communist Party was also building. By, 1935, by 1939, the influence of the Communist Party in the labor movement was equal to, or in some unions greater than, that of the Social Democrats and the reformists. The membership of the party had also grown among workers, the unemployed, immigrants and farmers, rising to 15,000 by the time of the Eighth Party Convention in, two, in uh, 1937. Uh, World War II, the Communist Party warned the defeat in Spain would result in a global attack on the working class by fascist forces in Europe and Asia, and an attack on the newborn socialist state of the USSR. The party also warned that the fascist threat would also grow inside Canada, deja vu, eh? as capitalists here would try to use it to attack the increasingly militant working class and the growing influence of the Communist Party within it. This was most evident in Quebec with Maurice Duplessis and the Union Nationale government, which had Nazi sympathies and was supported by Quebec fascists like Adrien Arcan. It was Duplessis who introduced the infamous padlock law that made it illegal to rent a hall to communists, including the Communist Party and any other labor or progressive organization or individual deemed to be communist. This included the hunger marchers, strikers, and the Montreal Trades and Labor Council, which at that time was led by communists. Duplessis joined, the Ontario, uh, joined with Ontario Premier Mitch Hepburn to declare a, a war on the class-based labor movement with the aim of smashing it in the country's industrial heartland of Ontario and Quebec. Both supported banning the Communist Party and the CIO. In 1939, the Wars and Measures Act was declared, and by June 1940, the Communist Party, YCL, Canadian Labour Defence League, Finnish Organization of Canada, uh, Ukrainian Labour uh, Temple, uh, Canadian Labour Temple, Fed, uh, whoops, ULFTA, <laughs> the Ukrainian Organization, which is now known as the AUC, were banned. Their assets were seized and many of their leaders were interned, including 250 members of the Communist Party, many of them militant trade unionists. Their homes... What year was that? Uh, 1939. Um, uh, the homes and property of the 250 people who were interned, members of the party, were also seized 
Most people don't know that. It wasn't just the party's property, but their homes were seized and their families were left destitute, something which, of course, the party addressed and uh, looked after these families. The Seventh Congress of the Comintern had called on the communists to build a broad-based popular front against fascism that would be based on a united front of the working class and united action and extend outwards to include farmers, intellectuals, the petty bourgeois, and all others whose interests conflicted with fascism. Many social democratic workers supported the party's call for labor and working class unity to defeat fascism and responded favorably to the party's proposal to establish a federated party of labor that would include the CCF and the Communist Party and would be based on an agreed on set of policies and a plan of action. But the leadership of the CCF would not agree. And it was left to the Communist Party to reach out to left and progressive workers on the shop floor, many of them social democrats, by the way, to form caucuses and committees that would create the basis for united action in the labor movement in the struggle against fascism. In the more than 70 years since, communists have worked hard in their unions and workplaces to find the basis for common action of communists, NDPers, and other left-wing workers on specific economic and political issues over the objections of the right-wing anti-communist and sectarian leadership of the NDP and the reformist leadership in the trade union movement. While the party worked hard to unite workers around the war effort and war production, this also meant a different approach to strikes and work stoppages during the war. While there were strikes, they were mostly the result of employer intransigence or lockouts. The government supported the company's greed with a massive demonstration of force by the OPP during the Kirkland Lake Gold Strike in 1941-42. There's quite a photograph inside the party history, by the way, where you see a huge long column of uh, OPP walking through Kirkland Lake. Most workers understood what was at stake during the war years and why the struggle for better wages and conditions had to take second place to the defeat of fascism. But the greed of the biggest capitalist corporations, which made massive profits from war production, meant that working people's anger and determination to make big gains at the end of the war was a material force that exploded out of the gate in Windsor in the historic 1945 Ford strike. The issue was the right to a closed shop. The company's position was that the union could only represent the workers that collected dues from, not all the workers in the plant. This was the open shop that the Tories in Ontario and Saskatchewan and everywhere else today, too, by the way, want to return to now. A long strike ensued in which almost the entire population of Windsor supported the strikers in a monumental face-off between labor and capital that would impact the whole country. Windsor had been the epicenter of organizing the Auto Workers Union, and it was the Communist Party which initiated and led the CIO's organizing drive there in the 1930s. The party had a large membership in Windsor at that time, many of them working in Ford and all of them active in the strike. Efforts to bring in the army and break the strike failed, and finally with the Ford plant barricaded by a huge pileup of workers, cars, trucks, buses, and everything else to hand, and similar strikes breaking out across the country, the company finally agreed to recognize the UAW as the bargaining agent for the entire workforce. This was Local 200, the oldest auto local in Canada. The following year, Hamilton Steelworkers at Stelco went on strike. The issue once again was the right to unionize in the closed shop. The steel company was determined to break the union. And the workers' militancy combined with the work of the party and the left to mobilize support among workers in other industries and in the city's largely working class population. But these were the decisive factors in winning the strike. The right-wing international union uh, leadership of the Steelworkers Union was more opposed to the influence of the communists and the left in the strike and in the union than in the company's efforts to break the strike and the union. Among many other actions, the party brought out a huge contingent of veterans led by the rubber workers Harold Keaton in support of the strike, while city councillor and party leader Helen Anderson successfully led the fight to keep the army outside the city limits, while the company demanded military action against the strikers. The company was isolated. 
Finally, the government forced, was forced to appoint Ivan Rand to find a solution. The solution was the closed shop and the, right, the legal right of workers to unionize. This is the famous Rand formula that right-wing governments have sought to overturn ever since. In June 1946, the uh, International Woodworkers struck in BC. Ontario's Lumber and Saw Union, led by Bruce Magnuson, also struck in 1946, followed by the Textile Workers in Quebec and the Canadian Seamen's Union in the Great Lakes. In 1947, work struck, uh, workers struck Naranda Mines in Rouen, Quebec, followed two years later by the very famous inf uh, uh, asbestos strike. The strike wave focused on increased wages, a 40-hour work week, and union recognition. The number of strikes between 1945 and 1947 tripled. Almost all of these strikes were led or heavily influenced by the leadership of the left and the communists in the labor movement, striking fear into the employers, governments, and right-wing social democracy. This coincided with imperialism's great distress over the fact that the Soviet Union had survived the war, despite 22 million Soviet dead, and that socialism had expanded in Europe. In response, the US government dropped the Iron Curtain in 1946. You've all heard of that, I'm sure. Uh, uh, officially opening the Cold War against the Soviet Union and a new offensive against labor. They always go together. Their specific goal was to smash the Communist Party, its caters, and its influence in the labor movement with the overall objective, objective of breaking the back of the left and the class-based unions in the trade union movement. As it had done since its inception, the Communist Party's response was to build unity in the labor movement, to repel the corporate attack and secure more economic and political gains for the working class. The party had the same approach in the country to mobilize the progressive and democratic forces to repel the drive to reaction in war and to secure, secure gains for working people. Crucial to the success of this strategy was the response of the CCF and the social democratic leadership in the trade unions. If it had responded positively uh, and united with the Communist Party to oppose the Cold War, things would have turned out quite differently for the working class and for the left in Canada in the years that followed, but it didn't. That is, the CCF didn't. Instead of lining up with the, instead lining up with social democratic parties in most other advanced capitalist countries to join with employers and their governments to attack the Soviet Union and the socialist countries to attack socialism and to attack communists and the left in the trade union movement. In 1946, the CCF proposed motions Get this, this is important. The CCF proposed motions to both the Trades and Labor Congress and the CCL conventions to prohibit communists from holding, holding office in the labor movement. The motions were defeated, but the anti-communist campaign continued with CCF motions to both of the 1947 conventions, labor conventions, condemning, quote, militant Russian communistic imperialism assisted by its fifth columns in all countries. That would be you. <laughs> this was consistent with the U.S. Taft-Hartley Act adopted in 1947, which made it illegal for communists to even be members of unions with headquarters in the United States. The international unions and the United Steelworkers in the first place were the main conduit for importing anti-communism and witch hunts into the Canadian labor movement. In full compliance with the McCarthy witch hunts, communists in the U.S. were expelled from their unions, and the unions that refused to expel communists were themselves expelled from the AFL-CIO using the infamous red clauses introduced in that period. These policies were imported into Canada through the international unions, which demanded compliance in their Canadian affiliates. That's how they did it. Once again, the issue of Canadian sovereignty and U.S. interference in Canadian unions came sharply into focus. The red clauses remained in the UAW and the U.S. Uh, WA constitutions until they were challenged legally by Comrade Jim Bridgewood in 1969 and Comrade John Severinsky in 1974 after the UAW refused to allow Bridgewood to hold elected office in the union, 
and the Steelworkers International tried to expel John Severinsky for his membership in the Communist Party. The Steelworkers backed off the expulsion, but left the Red Clause and the Union Constitution for another three decades. The government followed up in 1951 with legislation attacking labor and democratic rights, including, this will sound familiar, legislating the death penalty for criticizing the government's foreign policy. This is Canada, even in peacetime. A five-year jail term for criticizing the RCMP. A 10-year jail term for sabotage, which would also apply to strikes. So, uh, like the Liberals Bill C-59 today. Some, some parallels, right? Uh, mass outrage, such as that which helped to defeat Harper in the 2015 election over security state law Bill C-51, C forced the government to backtrack. Uh, what this episode sh also showed was that attacks on the Communist Party and the working class were always accompanied by attacks on civil and democratic rights by capitalist governments. Important point applies today. Thousands of communists and progressives lost their jobs in Canada and the U.S. as a result, along with their elected positions and influence in the labor movement. The labor movement was also split apart with more raids by the gangster SIU against the CSU, the Siemens Union, which involved beatings and murders on the waterfront by SIU enforcers. Both the CSU and UE were expelled from the CCL and the, and the Trades and Labor Congress. In every case, the dirty job was carried out by right-wing social democrats who seized the, op the opportunity to clean house and take control of the trade union movement in Canada. Two of the mo most notorious were David Lewis and Charlie Millard. Not surprisingly, the CCF at its 1956 convention dropped the Regina Manifesto and its call for socialism and workers' power from their program, replacing it with general statements of support for workers, social justice, fairness, etc. The fallout from this period, which continued through the 1950s and 60s, was enormous. Class collaboration and concessions were the order of the day, with political, economic, and foreign policies for Canada dictated by the Cold Warriors in Pittsburgh, Washington, Detroit, and other international offices south of the border. By the end, the CCF had secured its hold over the CLC and the Trades and Labour Congress, and in 1961 made the newly founded CLC a partner in the newly formed NDP. This is how socialism and class struggle unionism disappeared from the agenda of Canada's labor leadership. So if you wonder how they ever got from there to here, this is the answer. And though terrible setbacks were suffered during this period, the need for a class-based militant trade union movement that is sovereign, independent, and united is as great, if not greater today, with the rise of corporatism, war, reaction, and fascism in Canada and internationally. Um, I should say, comrades, I spent a lot of time talking about this particular period because it had such an enormous impact on what is on where we are today. But now I'm going to jump over a few things that have happened. So if, uh, if there are things here that are missed, you will appreciate that we want you to have some time to talk today and, and, and not only us in the front here. Um, the 1960s marked the end of the worst of McCarthyism in Canada and in the trade union movement though its disastrous consequences remained. This was the beginning of the scientific and technological revolution, which helped raise living standards, expanded education, including, including post-secondary education amongst workers, and also gave capitalism a new lease on life. For labor, the question was how to prevent the STR from destroying jobs and creating unemployment. For the Communist Party and the left, the issue was how to force the employers to share the benefits of the new technology in the workplace, including safer, less backbreaking work for workers and higher wages and living standards across the board. The reformists opposed concession, proposed concessions bargaining to protect jobs, a position they still advocate today. The party on the left proposed a struggle to force the employers to make concessions and share the enormous new wealth that was cre being created by workers using the new automated technology. 
The party proposed a shorter work week with no loss in take-home pay as the way to improve workers' lives while also creating jobs for those who would lose their jobs to the new technology and those young workers just starting out. This is our position today as well, as a new round of the STR is impacting production, employment and profits today. The late 1950s and 60s also saw a big influx of women into the workforce which reflected the growth of public services, the expansion of education, and the growth of the student population, as well as the economic impact of a slew of concessionary contracts signed during the Cold War years. Uh, QP was born to organize these public sector workers, mainly women, who were unwilling to accept the concessionary and collaborationist positions advocated, advocated in the reformist unions. QP and other public sector unions, notably CUPW, the postal workers, quickly became a militant and progressive force in the trade union movement. At the same time, teachers, nurses, and others in professions began to see that the unionized public sector had, sector had better security and conditions than the associations they belonged to. Professionals began to see themselves increasingly as workers, highly educated in some case, but workers nonetheless. <clears throat> This process took decades in some sectors as workers had to overcome non-class views of themselves perpetuated by their employers, the media, etc. The formation of the CLC in 1961 also reopened the question of unity of the labor movement, which the party said should involve changes to the CLC constitution to allow all unions without exception to join the CLC and which should include negotiations with the CNTU in Quebec, the Labour Central in Quebec, one of them, to include, to include it within the CLC along with the FTQ, the Quebec Federation of Labour, with full respect for the CNTU's uh, autonomy. Reading should stop and unions should work together with the goal of, of eventually establishing one union in each industry. Further, um, no, sorry, this is the way to build the unity and strength of the working class. Further, the labor movement must be democratized from the ground up, giving union members the ultimate say. It must be class-based, and it must be committed to united action. Domination of the labor movement by right-wing social democrats and the international union headquarters made the issue of peace and international solidarity very difficult. The international unions in the U.S. had adopted the U.S. State Department's foreign policy decisions as the gospel, and these were conveyed to the CLC's international department and to the Canadian sections of the international unions as the gospel. Massive struggles took place on the convention floor of, uh, uh, over Canada's support for NATO and NORAD, over the Vietnam War, over a myriad of U.S. invasions, and dirty wars around the world, and especially over the CLC's attitude to the socialist countries, the national liberation movements, including the African National Congress in South Africa, then fighting for, uh, against apartheid, and around the, the uh, WFTU, the World Federation of Trade Unions. By the 1970s, the push from the membership in conventions forced the right-wing leadership in the unions to start mobilizing for workers' rights and standards, and for social advances, including equality rights for women and for Quebec. The CLC convention in Edmonton, held in the early 1970s, was decisive in moving the labor movement in English-speaking Canada forward on the issue of the national question and Quebec. It was the delegates from Quebec and from the Communist Party who took to the floor to explain to delegates why Quebec was a nation and not a province and why the right to national self-determination meant a new, equal, and voluntary relationship uh, that had to be established in the country and in the CLC to achieve genuine unity between English-speaking and French-speaking workers. It was a sight to see. I was at that convention. It was one of the things that made me conclude I was in exactly the right place in my political life in the Communist <clears throat> Party. And the most impressive thing of all was the role that our party played through the work of our trade union members to win over convention delegates for a principal position on the national question 
and in Canada and for a new relationship in the CLC between workers and their respective organization in English-speaking Canada and in Quebec. It was a very important step forward for the unity of the working class across the country. In 1976, the first All-Canada General Strike took place over the issue of wage controls imposed by the federal government. It was the first such strike since the Winnipeg General Strike in 1919. Of course, that affected Winnipeg. This one affected the whole country. Again, it was the left in the labor movement, led by our party, which successfully pushed for the downing of tools across the country that paralyzed the capitalists for a day. It sent a strong message to the government and the corporations that the trade union movement was willing to use the strike weapon to back up its political demands. The party across the country was in the thick of the strike preparations across the country, working to make sure that key workplaces would not open, that public transit systems would not work to carry people to work, that picket lines would be personed by workers from other workplaces so that no one would be fired that people called in sick, in uh, mass sick calls. It was a great success that void workers and sent shivers down the backs of the corporate elite. October 14, 1976, yeah. And <laughs> uh, there's a photograph right at... Almost 2 million people in strike. 1976, in 1979, the Canadian Union of Postal Workers went out on a historic strike. Sorry. Did it? Oh. 1978. Excuse me. Yeah. 78. Uh, so the uh, CUPW went out on a historic strike that ended with the imprisonment of CUPW President Jean-Claude Perrault. The strike, which had crystallized around the issue of maternity leave and benefits, had won the support of working women and many men, too, across the country. When the government passed back to work legislation, the union refused to comply, facing huge fines and the jailing of Jean-Claude Perrault, who defiantly said that unjust laws should not be obeyed and should be broken. Across Canada, the labor movement debated the issue of just and unjust laws and the courage of the postal workers and their president in refusing to buckle. For the right wing in the labor movement, the postal workers had gone too far by challenging the government and the courts. But for workers who were demanding social as well as economic advances and militancy and democracy in the trade union movement, the CUPW strike was a new high watermark for labor. Out of this strike came widespread demands for change at the CLC and for a vehicle that could lead the fight for a shift to the left including class struggle policies and mass independent labor political action to win them. Not long after, the Action Caucus was born, parented by CUPW, UE, and the Communist Party. The 1970s were the decade of great victories for the working class globally and the defeat of U.S. imperialism in Vietnam, the victory of the Portuguese Revolution against Salazar, the victory of the People's Unity Government in Chile, not once but twice. The revolutions in Grenada and Ethiopia. Victories of the National Liberation Movements in Africa and Asia. The strength of the Soviet Union and the socialist countries whose revolutions were at that time irreversible, quote unquote. <laughs> but imperialism saw it too. Uh, responding in 1980 with Solidarnosc, the anti-communist trade union that targeted socialist governments and unions and loved the West under the benevolent hand of the Pope and the Catholic Church. Solidarność was also intended to be used against communist and the trade union movement in the capitalist countries. La Qualenza, a simple Polish shipyard worker, as he was uh, described in the media, capitalist media, who courageously fought the communist government of Poland for workers' rights and standards couldn't be wrong. Some of the comrades here will remember that time. It was a clever ploy that took advantages of the grievances of developing political crisis in Poland to feed Canadian workers who had, manipulated, who had been manipulated by Cold War anti-communist rhetoric for 30 years with a new line of anti-communist poison 
aimed to isolate communists and weaken their influence in the labor movement. The attack uh, marked the beginning of a new political and ideological offensive by capital against the working class. It was the era of Ronald Reagan, Margaret Thatcher, and Brian Mulroney, and their neoconservative agenda of free trade, corporate tax cuts, privatization, deregulation, and attacks on labor and democratic rights. In the 1984 election campaign, not surprised, don't be surprised, NDP leader Ed Broadbent announced that the NDP had done with the baggage of socialism. It was officially a party of capitalism with a human face. The Action Caucus played a key role through the 1980s organizing the left and mobilizing the center forces at many provincial federation of labor conventions and at the CLC. The party played a decisive role through the leadership of comrades like Val Bjarnason, Art Jenkin, Jean Perret, and other leaders of the UE and the party, as well as uh, comrades like Gordy Lambert, Jim Bridgewood in the UAW, Ray Stevenson from Steel, and many others. When the UE and other left-wing unions were forced, because of declining membership, to merge with the CAW, it was a very serious blow to the left in the labor movement and to the party. I don't think we realized how serious the consequences would be at the time. These communist-led unions had been the spine of the left in the labor movement and provided the solid base for the left to organize from. Before that, however, the Action Caucus decided to challenge the right-wing leadership of the CLC by running Jean-Claude Perrault for the CLC executive on a platform of progressive policies and mass action to win them. The candidate, the campaign, and the Action Caucus became synonymous with the demand for action, for change, and for progressive leadership. Perrault's election at that convention marked the first and the last time to date that the left had been able to break the administration slate at the CLC. In his autobiography and speeches since, Jean-Claude Perrault has remarked that the success of the campaign was marred only by the disappearance of the Action Caucus after his election when he said, and he was right, he needed it most. <coughs> the reason was the crisis in the Communist Party that began in the late 1980s and engulfed the party until 1992. In 1982, the, the CLC was faced with a split when the building trades unions departed en masse to form the Canadian Federation of Labour, uh, unaffectionately known as the Canadian Football League. It was a reactionary move on the part of right-wing union leaders in the construction trades aimed to weaken the growing militancy of the CLC affiliate unions and especially the growing demands for Canadian autonomy. The construction, trades, the construction trades unions were and continue to be plagued with a structure and rules that make the union hiring halls more like uh, labor markets than organizations devoted to advance the interests of workers. With seniority lists kept secret by the union, it is easy for corrupt business agents to pick and choose who will work and who won't based on political favoritism or even outright bribes. During the 1980s, all of the building trades unions were international unions headquartered in the U.S. with right-wing class collaboration leaderships in almost every case. The CFL finally folded up, and many of those unions returned to the CLC, though not all. A few are affiliated directly to the AFL-CIO in Canada without any Canadian affiliations at all. A very few, including the BRIC and Allied Workers of Canada, are breakaways from the international unions. In the case of the bricklayers, uh, brick and allied workers, it has bargaining rights in Ontario only and coexists in Canada with the International Union of Bricklayers and Masons and is therefore not eligible to affiliate to the CLC, local labor councils, or the provincial federations of labor. It's pretty isolated. The case of the BAC and others in similar situation underlines one of the problems with the CLC constitution which continues to reflect the interests of the CLC affiliates over those of workers trying to break away from right-wing international unions. Our long-held position is that workers should have the right to choose the union they want to belong to. This is not a green light for raiding, 
which is in fact the current solution of many CLC affiliates aiming to offset falling membership and dues income. It is, on the other hand, part of the democratization that will make unions more progressive, more accountable, and more membership driven. In, the mid, in, the, in 1985, Canadian auto workers called it quits with the UAW after the International intervened in bargaining to impose a concessions agreement on Canadian workers who strongly opposed the deal. The party gave its full support to the move to create an independent Canadian union, the CAW, which gave Canadian auto workers the power to be masters in their own house. Uh, and to be independent of the class collaboration and concessions policies on the, of the international union leadership. But as events of the last 60 years show, Canadian unions are not immune from concessionary collective agreements, sadly, sadly, uh, and leaderships. And the CAW is no exception. What is needed is a strong organized left within the union, within all the unions to fight for policies and strategies that are based on class struggle, not class collaboration. On the face of it, the conditions for success in this are greater in an independent Canadian union than in an international union. But reality is concrete, not abstract. And the specific conditions must be taken into account to achieve unity of the working class. In other words, a correct estimation of how the workers see the situation is essential. The decision of the IWA, the Woodworkers Union, to break away from their right-wing anti-communist international made sense to the comrades concerned in the heat of Cold War uh, McCarthyism and anti-communism. goes back to what we referred to earlier under the Taft-Hartley Act <coughs> after the Second World War. Go ahead. So it made, car it made sense to the comrades who were in the leadership fighting this stuff, but it didn't make sense to the membership who left the new union to return to the international. Why? Because of anti-communism and the Red Scare, no doubt, for the same reason. Uh, nevertheless, it was an error that weakened the Union by enabling the right wing to expel all of the communists in the Union for their acts of treason, as the international saw it. As events involving the SEIU and more recently the ATU, the transit workers, show not much has changed in this regard. The CLC constitution needs to be democratized to reflect the needs and interests of workers who want out of right-wing international unions. Until now, the interests of the CLC affiliates are the only interests that are considered. This has to change. Since the arrival of neoliberalism in the 1980s and 90s, jobs, wages of living standards have fallen down a deep, deep hole. As conditions uh, worsened for the working class, profits rose for the corporations, and reactionary governments moved politics sharply to the right across the world. At the beginning of this period, our party was consumed in a life and death struggle with liquidation, which came close to destroying the party from within. Perhaps not surprisingly, the liquidationist leaders included a number of trade unionists who were or became functionaries in the labor movement and later the NDP, and who found the party to be a dead weight on their careers. While holding leadership positions in the Central Committee, they conspired to form a new political party, which they called the party of a United Party of the Socialist Left, using our assets, a network of friends and contacts. After a four-year struggle, they were defeated and moved off leaving a trail of destruction behind them. The left in the, and uh, John was one of the people, John Humphrey was one of the people who was expelled by these guys during that period. Big mistake to, uh, to challenge their, uh, their, their view, but decisive. It was very important that that was done. And you. And, and uh, there were seven people initially who were expelled, and then everybody got expelled by these guys by the end of, the, by the end of it. Uh, the, left, uh, the left in the labor movement was also disoriented and confused by the overthrow of the Soviet Union, not surprisingly, <laughs> and by the struggle inside the Communist Party. This was replicated in countries around the world. Imperialism made gains, while working people and labor faced serious setbacks. 
the NDP share in the, shared in the celebration of socialism's defeat. I should tell you something right there. We worked hard to reorganize our work and made some gains in the struggle against austerity, working with broad-based coalitions, including many NDP members and trade unionists. Our party, our party began to grow again, especially amongst young people, and our work to rebuild the Action Caucus was aided by strong support from some leaders in the education unions, uh, which Dominic had a big hand in. Uh, uh, and these education unions in Ontario at the time were under sharp attack by the Harris Tories and had a direct interest in the strong left inside the labor movement. The postal workers, and to a lesser degree CUPE, lent their support to the Action Caucus, which had become the main voice of the left at, at the biggest conventions. As the economic crisis deepened, the NDP moved farther and farther away from the labor movement. Relying on labor for money and volunteers during election, but, but focused more and more on attacking and competing with the Liberals, while the Tories held government for a decade at the federal level and in many cities and provinces. It was a long way from the Regina Manifesto to the Liberal light policies and goals of NDP leader Jack uh, Layton. The trade union movement responded with strategic voting a strategy that nailed the Tories as the main danger to working people, but offered no alternative. The labor movement shifted to the right, with the teachers, nursing, building trades, and auto workers closely linked to the Liberal Party, while the NDP burnished its corporate credentials with promises to balance the federal budget and rein in public spending. Left-wing NDPers and Social Democrats sought to create new left Social Democratic parties all of them limited by anti-communism and sectarianism. What a mess. As politics and social democracy have moved to the right in Canada and the world, the far right has increased its footprint and its influence, so we all know about that. The decisive role of the labor movement and of communists in the labor movement today to combat fascism, to fight for independent labor political action, in support of a people's agenda for peace, jobs, increased wages and living standards, expanded public services, including health care, education, child care, affordable housing, nationalization of the banks and financial institutions, and energy and national resources, expanded civil labor, social and democratic rights is very important. This is the challenge ahead of us as we struggle towards socialism and working class power on this 100th anniversary of the Great October Socialist Revolution. Thanks,